Hello there, my name's Card. I'm a social sciences researcher with a long-standing interest in political organising. I've also recently taken to making these short, instructive and practical videos about what I've learned from where those areas intercede. In this video, I'll be talking about our modern, progressive perception of gender. But I won't just rehash all the same talking points and arguments you'll already know if this isn't your first day on niche leftist YouTube, but I would like to address the fact that I've never before seen anyone online discussing the real world effects of wholeheartedly embracing this line of thinking. It's one thing to sit around all day and argue over the philosophy of what performative appearance and social expectations all means, but there's no point learning all of this social theory if you're not going to use it somehow. When this channel talks organizing and activism, it's here to discuss the practicalities. But, just to get us all on the same page though, here's the abridged progressive history of gender norms. At the dawn of civilization, the first primitive societies all split their populations in half to divide essential labor, and they did so along the most physically obvious line, sexual dimorphism. That way, one half of society, the bigger, stronger, faster half, can do all the hunting, gathering, fighting, and so on, while the other half was entrusted to do the equally important job of rearing and raising children until they're themselves old enough to contribute in whichever way they're biologically predetermined to be expected to. As these early societies particularly those in what we now call classical Western civilization, grew in population and social complexity, both an explicit administrative structure of laws and an implicit system of cultural mores and social norms sprung up around them to reinforce these basic behaviors and attitudes towards the two gendered roles. Time goes on for several centuries, and what day-to-day -day life a career, and what that exact form of the administrative state apparatus all looks like varies throughout history and between geographical regions. But the common outcome is that we've now arrived at a point where global neoliberal capitalism still upholds a modern-day evolution of this as part of keeping itself running. Now, for basically all of living memory, the ideal domestic situation across the increasingly culturally homogenized Western world has been that men, who like blue and wear trousers, work a white-collar job to provide for their dress-wearing, pink-liking, home-bound wives, who in turn raise his two-and-a-half children and hopefully try their best to look pretty. Now I, and most leftists, could go on for hours about how capital will throw around a lot of weight to either crush or otherwise nullify any dissent from its social standards, lest the whole system go up in smoke because of the terminal crisis at the heart of extractive commerce all the more quicker. This is what the patriarchy refers to, a term you'll have no doubt heard before. Uh, not a literal group of people or even a set of codified beliefs per se, but rather the material reason capital has for oppressing women even more than the baseline amount of exploitation it does to everyone. Institutional or systemic sexism is when the cultural attitudes this discrimination has created uh, becomes so pervasive it affects every aspect of daily life like enabling hurtful jokes and stereotypes about female incompetence or ignorance, or normalizing hiring practices that make it harder for women to find jobs. I'm sure there's a BreadTube video you've already seen that can explain all this to you again in a much more drawn out way. But realistically, if you're ever seeing this, you get the gist of what I'm talking about already. Here's the thing. If you do understand all that, and you consciously think sexism is bad, as surely we all do, and even if you yourself are in fact a woman, 
you still almost certainly have some underlying biases and prejudices in your thinking, just as a result of having been raised in this society. And that's not good, but it is normal. And here on the left, we acknowledge this and try to work on it. The same thing goes with something like race and how skin colour now overlaps very broadly with economic prospects in much of the colonial first world and so on. Very few people you'll ever encounter actually think of themselves as racist, but everyone, especially people in a position of societal privilege, can't help but have the culture you're born and raised in affect your thinking in some way. It's a simple enough thesis to understand. At least, I think it is. Anyway, all this primer actually brings me to the point of this video. Ever since, at least here on the left, our conceptual framework of gender moved from being rooted in strict biological essentialism over to being a matter of performative semantics and semiotics, we've now got a new term that describes something that's very similar to this sort of underlying bias that we've just described. This new term is cis-heteronormativity, which admittedly is a bit of a mouthful, but what it means is that even people who consciously consider themselves progressive, and perhaps those that support LGBT rights, still treat one man, one woman relationships and open quote, traditional gender roles as everyone's default setting. Uh, most people, including lefties, will essentially just assume they're straight and just uncritically go with it, rather than ever putting any real thought into their identity. Say, for example, you go find your average straight male progressive campus activist type. They'll readily tell you that gender roles are made up and that anyone can wear whatever they want and so on. Then ask them something like how regularly they publicly go out in skirts and dresses. And what a shock, their answer's never. And of course, they'll say it's just because it's not their personal style. And see, that's valid, probably perfectly true even. But why isn't it something they'd wear? Because they've been raised since birth in a culture that would disapprove of them doing so. Similarly, that same type of avowed progressive will claim to believe that trans women are real women, but just flat out won't consider dating or even hooking up with one. The reason for that being that even if they've fully taken on board the argument that gender is completely made up, they still can't get over their deeply internalized hang-ups that society's given them ever since they've been consciously aware of what a sexual orientation is. And honestly, I think we can acknowledge that people in activist and political organizing spaces could really do more to get over their own unconscious cis-heteronormativity. Just on a purely ideological level, I don't think your heart can ever truly be in it if you're trying to advocate the progressive line, but can't fully grasp the implications beyond just paying the argument's lip service. And practically, it's one thing to understand all this, but entirely another to ever put it to use. The first time I ever saw what hysterical conservatives have taken to calling gender ideology in my late teens, uh, I already knew enough history to acknowledge that the general oeuvre of the transgender rights thesis was correct. Gender roles are made up, and there's nothing inherently biological about what type of clothes you like wearing, or how long your hair is, or even something like wearing makeup. It's all completely a matter of cultural norms. And a few years on from that, by the time I was entering university, it had really taken off. Everything I just mentioned was practically entry-level lefty knowledge for people around my age. And what we once called biological sex meant absolutely nothing in progressive circles now. And people weren't just going from girl to boy and vice versa. We'd discovered a whole spectrum of identities somewhere in the middle. 
and I, for one, think this is great. The political right has been screaming about postmodernist slippery slopes for quite a while now, but I don't see why anyone without some psychotically imagined investment in gender norms should care at all. We've gotten to a point where even in the most milk toast liberal spaces, you can cite any identity and it's valid. To describe something is to make it real. No combination of appearance, terms of address, and underlying biology is beyond the pale here. It really is practically magic. And we're even celebrating people brave enough to come out of the custom pronouns closet. And seeing all this sort of thing in person for the first time after I moved to a city was mind blowing. And quite frankly, if you can't see how to use this and maybe even have a little fun along the way, I don't even know what to tell you. If you've assumed that you can't reap these benefits because you're not, open quote, really trans, you need to start acting pragmatic and give yourself a bit more credit. I personally didn't even get into leftism just for the social causes either. I grew up in a small and relatively apolitical town. My principal driving motivation was originally just a complete rejection of ever seeing my time and effort alienated from me and used to enrich someone else. But when you're around so many people now whose main political cause is queer rights or trans rights for years, you pretty quickly pick up on the lingo and what the pressing issues are. And in short, what I've learned is that all the trans-centric discourse basically revolves around what you could call a handful of factions. The first of these factions are the self-styled TERFs, or trans-exclusionary radical feminists. These are the people who are all for, open quote, women's issues, but reject the concept of transgenderism. They're usually cis women themselves, and may or may not also be political lesbians or deep into performative misandry. You'll often see these kinds of people trying to open up a platform for themselves in lefty spaces, both in real life and online but they're actually pretty reactionary, and their arguments are just wrong and bad. The next major group are the transmedicalists. These are people, usually themselves openly transgender, who obviously think that transgenderism of at least one stripe is real, but then try to argue that not every trans person is valid. Usually their position boils down to gatekeeping labels, based on whether or not someone is, or intends to, medically transition. That means taking the hormones and getting the surgeries and all that. They tend to write off the identities of uh, non-binary people, and call themselves transsexuals in order to delineate themselves from the other, less hardline trans people, who incidentally will often call them true scum as a pejorative. The third and last of these major factional positions in the contemporary trans discourse doesn't really have a proper name, but it's essentially the most progressive stance of the lot, and it's the one that is both pro-trans rights and accept non-binary identities, and basically believes that one's identity affirms itself. There's no gatekeeping. Your existence as a man, woman, neither, or anything else, is valid because you've declared it to be. This is also personally the side I'm backing. For one thing, the strict medicalists are doing themselves no favours by trying to argue that their specific rejection of social norms is legitimate, but anyone else's isn't. Uh, real talk, just to any trans medicalists that ever inexplicably end up hearing this, uh, but you do realise that mainstream society sees you the exact same way you see the cringy teenage TikTok they-thems, right? If the real reactionaries got their way and a right-wing death squad had you kneeling before a pit 
You're not going to earn any extra points in their eyes by explaining that you're the right kind of transgender. As for the transmedicalist argument that transgenderism is the result of some innate biological factor or chemical imbalance in the brain or something like that, and that's why you can gatekeep the pretenders out, I'm going to say the exact same thing I heard years ago when I heard the same explanation for what caused being gay. I don't buy it for a second, and furthermore, if you genuinely think that being any kind of queer is caused by something that you might be able to physically identify prior to birth, you'd better hope science never discovers exactly what that is, because the second that humanity discovers an in utero gay gene or trans gene, a lot of people will all of a sudden be fine with abortion under at least one circumstance. And you won't be able to get that far-right eugenicist toothpaste back in the tube. To the wider left-wing community's credit, most people in progressive spaces do seem to accept the non-medicalist line on trans issues writ large. Self-ID and not gatekeeping identities and all that. But returning to that new term I brought up earlier that this video is about, cis-heteronormativity, I can't say that I think most people have really thought about why it's the correct position to take. But still, let's say you're still with me here. We need to talk about how you can finally use all of this theory for something useful. If you want to genuinely acknowledge that anyone can have any identity or dress however they want or use whatever names and pronouns they want, you might as well start yourself, or at the very least, change things up every now and then, if only to keep life from getting too stale. If you really need to, you can think of it as a sort of progressive accelerationism of a sort. At the very least, when you start suggesting that, you get all the turfs and true scums to start climbing out of the woodwork to argue with you, and it's always nice to clean house in your activist spaces every now and then. But here's the best thing. You could, for example, play dress up and do the new pronouns in all your young, hip, lefty spaces and still be, open quote, normal everywhere else. Surely you don't dress and act the same way with friends as you do at work or school, or church, or with family, and so on, already. You might as well get as wild and wacky with it where you can anyway. And let's just be frank here. In a lot of leftist circles, your voice will be given less weight if you present as a typical straight white man. That fact might sound like it's a bit of reactionary propaganda, but it's true. And it's actually good, because it's correcting for the fact that those sorts of voices and opinions have long historically been, and still are, given disproportionate weight everywhere else in society because of facts like the aforementioned patriarchy and the institutional racism and sexism and so on. Here's the thing. You can still get around a lot of that by being loudly and visibly queer. And here's the real magic reason why this works. Because we all agree that identifying something is what makes it real. Knowing this, I won't act in bad faith per se, and my support for queer rights isn't disingenuous. But if we make identity this malleable, but still attach this much meaning to it, then I am going to take it as far as I'm enabled to do so. Bonus points for the fact this makes the outright reactionaries and all the bad kind of liberals really mad too. I'm perfectly willing, ready, and able to claim any sort of identity and pronouns in the moment if it seems advantageous or fun. And quite frankly, you should be too. And there's nothing that will get you over your internalized heteronormativity quicker either. Gatekeeping is bad, 
but it's kind of done away with when no facet of your identity is necessarily set in stone. Further still, it almost sounds like I'm the regressive one here, but actually, my attitude on the matter, in reality, is the furthest left it seems possible to get at the moment. To put it simply, TERFs are wrong and bad, transmedicalists are wrong and bad, gatekeepers are wrong and bad, and I will talk over all of them at any opportunity. A woman-only space sounds innocuous enough, but it's often, unfortunately, a turf dog whistle. Fortunately, we can rhetorically maneuver around that sort of argument now. Remember, you're allowed to say whatever you need to subvert exclusionary spaces. Say you're a man one day, say you're a woman the next, and non-binary on the weekends if you have to. And if someone ever calls you out for flip-flopping whenever it suits your needs, tell them it's this new thing you've recently discovered on Tumblr called gender fluidity. You can use this sort of attitude in other areas of your life too. It's a nifty little option to always keep in the back of your mind. If you're currently a man and you're looking for a university grad-level white-collar job and things aren't going so great, switch your gender to female and update your profile on sites like LinkedIn to reflect this. I guarantee you'll immediately get a lot of recruiters reach out suddenly. I personally know more than one person I've seen get a very cushy office job doing exactly that. Hell, if I were in their shoes, I'd take it even further and try and bait a discrimination lawsuit out of someone in management by citing transphobia to any HR rep who will listen. Or, if you're ever signing up for car, home, or contents insurance, play around with what the different gender options are and see how it affects your quote. The results might surprise you, and you can just go with whatever leans more in your favour. If you live in a country with mandatory military service or a draft for all men of a certain age, couldn't hurt to try getting out of it the same way either. And while you're doing it, tell all of the transmedicalist pick-me's that they're just wallowing in a bucket full of crabs mentality, and that their little pity party oppression Olympics isn't helping anyone. The funniest thing about saying that is that it's completely true, but they'll still hate hearing it. And some more practical advice. If anyone ever calls you duplicitous for acting like this, it's not that hard to rebut them too. I've discussed the righteousness of deceiving reactionaries on this channel before, but you can extend the, all the same principles to anyone trying to tell you that whatever self-serving gender identity you've just made up on the spot is invalid too. Uh, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that you're an assigned male at birth person who's otherwise entirely masculine presenting, and you've just shown up to a woman's only meeting with she, her pronouns, and someone else at the meeting tries to tell you that you specifically aren't a woman. In this sort of situation, the go-to move should be saying something along the lines of, no, actually you are, and surely no one would ever lie about being trans for the sake of clout. Why, don't you know how rampant transphobia is? Or, I'm entitled to explore and question my labels, aren't I? All brimming with mock indignation. With this sort of attitude, and a completely pragmatic approach to switching pronouns whenever, uh, coupled with a complete sense of social invincibility, you could actually be racking up wins for the gender-diverse community all day every day. Had you even considered that before you started listening to this video? Give it some thought, and if you try it out, you might even come to start liking it. That's what we in the know call gender euphoria. Now, if I'm allowed to say something even marginally sincere that isn't just bullish point-making for the sake of an argument, 
everything I've just said is somewhat exaggerated, one could say. But there's at least an essence of truth in there somewhere, uh, one that I hope you can identify and take something from yourself. For the record, I really do think that self-ID trumps trying to set up some weird barrier to letting people find an identity that works for them. Uh, also, I think billowy and flowing clothes actually look great on men, and I would like it if they were more mainstream. For what it's worth, for the past few years now, any time I've ever had to fill out a form where they offer you a spot to write in a custom gender, I've been putting down the word runcible as a joke. And as far as anyone listening to me online need be concerned, I'll canonically answer to all pronouns. And maybe if I was mm, five years younger and I felt like I needed a special name for my ambivalence, I might feel like the non-binary label fit me, but as it is, I'm not all that fussed for any particular term. Well, thank you for listening to all of that, even though... Well, thank you for listening to all that, and even though on the whole it wasn't worth your time, I hope you gleaned something from it. Once again, my name's Card. This has been Card Posting. Until next time, bye for now, and have a lovely day.